Let's book a regular. It's real. <laughs> How many weeks till Coast Trek? Anybody know? 18 weeks. <laughs> I'm not saying that to scare you. I'm just giving you a reality check. Perfect time to start training, by the way, um, before the Christmas silly season comes into play. And the reason we created Coast Trek was to inspire our clients to train through Christmas and not fall off the wagon. So I'm hoping that you guys are going to take up that challenge too and get in the majority of your training um, before the New Year's Eve. Um, when it comes to New Year's and other people are bemoaning the fact that they haven't got any fitter, you guys are going to be thinking, this is great, this is the fittest I've ever been at New Year's Eve. So I've tried to summarise uh, for you the top tips um, that myself and my team have put together over the years. Um, we've all done several hundred kilometre events. We walked the Sydney Coast Trek last month from Palm Beach to Balmoral in 10 hours to trial out the maps for you, to pick up any um, instances within the trail notes that we needed to, to gather or correct or edit um, and to trial out our gear. So it's very fresh in my mind. We've only just done it and I'm, I'm looking forward to sharing with you my top tips for getting fit for COVID. They're all F's by the way because we're here to support the Fred Hollows Foundation um, and I'm hoping you won't think of any other F's as you're going along the trail. Um, but how about we start with fitness because that's probably top of your list on how, how to get fit, how do I prepare to walk 50 or 100 kilometres. And what I want to say up front is it's all about quality and not quantity. So if you've sat down and planned 60, 80 kilometre sessions um, or 30 kilometres every week, I really encourage you to get the training guide out, which is on the website, get out the training logs and look at what we've suggested in terms of the distances that you walk because it's all about quality and effort and not about walking loads and loads of what we call junk miles because you're going to wear out your body and you may suffer injury. So that's my message for you tonight. Be clever with your training and I'm going to tell you how to do that. Um, if you make hills and stairs your friends, um, they're the best weapon for improving your fitness. Interval training on hills and stairs and soft sand walking. Okay, I can hear Dai whispering soft sand. You can thank Dai for all the compulsory soft sand sections on Coast Trek. Um, and the reason they're there is to encourage you to enjoy the beautiful coastline. But you do need to practice soft sand walking. It's not something that comes naturally to us. Um, and do lots of stretching in between. If I think about my training regime for the 50k Coast Trek that we just did, my typical week would be a three-hour coast trek, uh, sorry, three-hour trek training session on a Tuesday, and a two-hour trek training session on a Friday, in which I carry a 15 kg pack, and we do soft sand, stairs, hills, um, and distance walking on trails. I also then throw in a couple of cross-training sessions, and then a swim or a Pilates and a stretch session. And in the lead up to the 50k, the furthest we walked was 130k walk um, and another 22k trail run that we did um, which was another event so two big ones and in between the rest were around the 12 to 15 kilometer mark so if that gives you any indication of what you need to do for the 50k um, I hope that that covers for you that you don't need to go out there week after week doing 30 40 kilometers all right the couple of long sessions that you do will teach you about your foot care, your nutrition, your hydration, and your mental toughness. But if you want to improve your fitness, you need to do shorter distances and go harder. Does that make sense? Good. Build up slowly and train consistently. Training is very different for a beginner than for someone who's done 50 or 100 kilometers before. So again, check out the training guide and the training logs under Plan and Train on the website and you'll find out where you need to start. Okay, start off slowly if you're a beginner and build up your strength. In terms of walking on the sand, we do ask that you stay off the sand dunes and protect the environment. We'll talk a little later about um, <coughs> responsible walking and leaving no trace because we, we want to leave the coastline as we found it. Alex? That's the, the coaches in training on Fraser Island. So we did an 18 kilometer soft sand walk and learned about muscles in our feet that we never knew we had. Um, 
I'd like to talk about the team because I believe that's one of the most important aspects of doing an event like Postrec. Uh, you're there to do it together and to share the experience and you're, you're taking on a goal that, that's bigger than yourself. So you need to be able to tune in to your teammates and know when somebody needs you. If someone goes quiet, usually it means there's something wrong and you need to get them up the front of your team and find out what it is that they need. Okay? So learn to just be aware of your teammates, work together to get a training schedule that works for you all, and have a common goal. Discuss the time that you're aiming for, and be prepared to adjust it if you need to, due to injury, heat, blisters, whatever may pop up on the day. So you're going to learn about all those things during training, which is exciting, because by the time you get to the event, you're professionals, and you're going to know what to expect, and how to treat your bodies, and how to get the right nutrition in to make it the best day ever. That's where you need to go on the website to find all these top tips. There's a training guide that covers everything from heat, nutrition, foot care, training. There's logs, there's timing calculators. If you want to work out your average time for, for the event and getting to the man checkpoints. There's little bits about finding the best support crew. They're very important, by the way. And, um, and safety, of course, safety first is all about keeping safe, especially near road crossings, and uh, looking after each other in the event of extreme weather. Anyone want to take a guess at how many steps you would have walked in the 50 kilometres? No guesses? 70,000 steps. <coughs> and 419 flights of stairs. Okay. That was, that's what was on my Fitbit at the end of the 50k, so I can tell you it's real. Talking about your friends and how to keep them, okay? Many of you might have family and friends in the team. And uh, again, this is all about alternating the order of the team. Don't let one person always hang out at the back. It's the hardest place to be at the back of the team. Alternate and bring that person to the front. Keep changing the order of your team every five to 10 kilometers. Um, address any serious pace issues during your training. If you really find you've got a, a speedy person in your team and they're just not going to be able to hang out and wait for the other three, you need to talk about it and, and adjust your, your strategy um, or find a reserve. <laughs> uh, big, big pace differences can, can really um, count for a lot of uh, sadness within a team on the day because somebody's just going to want to go and the rest of you are going to feel like you're trying to play catch up. So, do talk about your goal um, and adjust it when you need to. Remember why you're doing this walk when it gets hard. Um, think about Ben and his team in the pouring rain, in the dark, on the trails. And think strong. It's all about what goes on in your head, okay? You guys can do the training and get fitter in terms of your body, but on the day, it's all about what, what's going on inside your head. I know how much... Um, you guys like to talk about gear and shopping. So um, I was going to say that I don't normally dress like this, but in fact I actually do. So um, <laughs> the reason I'm dressed up as if I'm going to a training session is because I wanted to show you what to wear on Coast Trek. And this is just what I wear, but I thought it was easier to show you than, um, than to have to tell you. So wicking material, lightweight, don't wear cotton. When it gets wet, it chafes and it's really uncomfortable and it doesn't dry very quickly. So lightweight clothing, whether it be running shorts, skins, um, two times you, whatever your CWX compression pants, they're also cool. Whatever you want to wear, train in it, and don't change it on the day, okay? Trail runners or runners are perfect for your 50 kilometer um, or 100K trek. It's up to you to test out your shoes. I like to have two pairs of shoes and change halfway. Some of you might prefer to use a softer running shoe for the second half, the second 50, because there's a lot more hard surfaces along the way, concrete paths and steps, whereas the first section has a lot more beach and uh, kind of rooty, rocky trails. So test out your shoes in your training. Some of you may even want to wear boots at night if you've got any ankle issues or concerns about the dark. Um, what else? A lightweight rain jacket. Okay. If you saw the photos from this year's event, people were wearing their rain jackets. 
and a poncho and whatever else they could find. Um, when it's hot, you probably won't even bother because you'll just sweat in the Sydney heat. But that one fits nicely into my pack and it's got sealed seams. So that's really important that you test out your, your reindeer and make sure that it actually is waterproof. Walking poles, for, especially for those of you that have knee issues, those can um, reduce the impact on your joints by over 30%. So have a talk to um, Ian from Trek and Travel who's here tonight and he'll tell you all about walking poles. This is a pack that I use. Um, the reason I like this one is because I, I run some of the trails and it doesn't move around a lot. It can just fit in a two litre bladder, um, my rain jacket, my first aid, very important, your fluoro safety vest. And in the front I can have my phone and my snacks and I can also actually fit a bottle there for mixing electrolytes. So that's just an example of a pack that you can use. What else would I have in my pack? First aid, a bandage, blister blocks or compedes for blisters, um, strapping tape, emergency blankets, um, some painkillers, some tiger balm, and my head torch and extra batteries. For those of you doing the day 50, you do need a head torch. You actually start out in the dark at Palm Beach. Registration is early on event day and it's pretty dark. And many of you may end up walking in the dark on the last section that around from Manly to the finish at Balmoral. So please make sure you have a head torch, especially during training. You never know when you get caught out in the sun sunset. Talking about the weather, which is um, in the forefront of our minds at the moment, many of you will know that over the last couple of weeks, National Parks has actually closed. Most of the bushy headlands around this area that fall within their, um, the National Parks um, map. We encourage you to always check before you go out training. If you think there's extreme heat or strong winds on the way, go on to the BOM website, the Royal F Rural Fire Service or the National Parks and just double check if there's any um, warnings in place before you set out and be prepared to adapt your training. Um, you can still go out and train unless there's lightning, um, but choose a coastal section where there's no bushland and do some soft sand training or some stairs. Just be prepared to adapt your training according to the weather. We can't control the weather and the same for event day. Expect the unexpected. Um, train in all weather so that when event day comes you're prepared for anything and you know how your gear works too. Food and fluid, I'm not going to touch too much on these two F's because we've got some great experts here to help you with that tonight but what I've learned is that getting your nutrition and your hydration right is, is, is important for all of us, not just those that are aiming to run it in seven hours because if you're feeling unwell, nauseous, you're dehydrated or overhydrated, that can really make you feel terrible and sometimes unable to continue on the trail. So you need to employ strategies to make sure that you get that eating and drinking right. And we're going to hear more about that in a minute. But I would say I set an alarm on my watch every 45 minutes. The alarm goes off and I go, have to eat something. Even if I don't feel like it, I'm going to eat something. And you can do it with your team. Nominate someone in your team to be the food queen and she can shout out every 45 minutes, you've got to eat something guys, even if it's a couple of jelly beans or a piece of Vegemite sandwich, it really makes a difference, um, balance out your blood sugar levels and help you to keep going. You're asking your body to do a big thing and you may not feel like eating, especially in the heat, but you've got to get that nutrition in. Um, it also stops you playing mind games. Have you ever been really hungry and you just go crazy? Yeah, and you get really grumpy and you just, you know, um, it, it's amazing what, you, what happens when you, when you don't have enough um, nutrition or hydration. You, you go a bit crazy and your, your friends might not love you so much. Um, learn to drink and eat on the flat bits and the, um, the downhills. So knowing the course is really important because you might say, hey guys, there's a huge climb coming up, we're not going to eat just yet. Um, we'll do the big climb up the headland and when we're heading down we'll have a big drink and, and eat some snacks on the way. So, Learn the route so you know where to eat and drink. And just know that tolerance for food 
and hydration of any kind is, is a very personal thing and everybody finds something that works for them. But that's why you guys are going to go out there and train and experiment with different food and drinks so that you know what works for you on the day. And try not to try anything new on the day. And that goes for gear, what you eat, what you drink, um, and anything else that applies on the day. You really need to practice, practice all of those things to make it work. Leave no trace. We very much want you guys to go out there and enjoy the coastline. And as we mentioned, you guys cross 18 different councils, national parks on your journey along the coast. And we need to make sure that we preserve that area and we, we keep it pristine. So we ask you during training and on the event to leave no trace as you go. Um, avoid the sand dunes, use the bins, and um, you need to have rubber stoppers on your walking poles if you're going to use them. It's a national parks requirement. So please make sure you speak to one of us afterwards if you're not sure what that means. Um, and use the toilets along the route. There's plenty of them along near the Surf Life Saving Clubs. What to do now? You guys are probably wondering, where do I start? Um, you need to sit down with your team and look at the next 18 weeks and plan your training. In line with the guides we've put together, the training logs and the calculators and work out how you're going to do it. Use your maps, you've got great map books, you can also look at it um, on Google, on the computer, or on your phone, so you can see an aerial view of the route and work out the best sections. Um, we've also got a Coast Trek training weekend coming up, and you guys can get an early bird price for that if you book before Sunday this week. We'll be running an all-day program with the coaches from Wild Women on Top, and talking you through the most time efficient way to do interval training, soft sand training, and teaching you lots of stretches you can do along the way too. There's also route training in January, so you can train with the coaches on the Coast Trek route, and especially for those of you who might be a little bit nervous about walking in the dark, I would encourage you to do some night training um, to figure out how to use your head torch and just feel what, what it's like to walk in the dark along the trails. Just remember you're going to be out of your comfort zone in many ways, um, on many occasions, and that's a good thing. Okay? Um, you'll learn a lot about yourself, about your teammates, and you, you'll come out learn, having learned a lot of lessons about what you thought you were capable of and now what you think you know you can do um, beyond what you thought in the beginning. So um, I, I really encourage you to go out there and do your best, train together, enjoy the coast, it's absolutely beautiful. I was just, watched, you know, I just loved doing the coast trick a few weeks ago and, and being amazed at those beautiful beaches, just one after the other, that we're so blessed to have in Sydney. We're going to take questions at the end, ladies and gentlemen, but I'd like to um, introduce to you now Dr. Joanna McMillan, who's going to talk about nutrition and hydration. Dr. Joanna is the official nutritionist of the Channel 9 Today Show. She's a sports dietitian, the founder of Get Lean, and she also walked the 100 kilometer coast trek this year. So I know you're in very good hands, and we're very fortunate to have Dr. Joanna here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And what a brave lot you are. I've done it now, so I can talk from experience. And, um, and just to reiterate what Lisa said, it is an absolutely fabulous event to do. I decided about five years ago that I was going to try and undertake a physical challenge every year. And I just want to reiterate the point about putting yourself out of your comfort zone and giving yourself some sort of a challenge is actually more than a physical challenge. It really does inspire you to think about all sorts of aspects of your life, and you're going to have plenty of time to do that during all this walking <laughs> training. Um, but it really does change your mindset about all sorts of things. And you start thinking about the way your business will go or what you're doing in your personal life or... Um, all sorts of things. I've changed so much in my life over since I've been doing these kinds of physical challenges. So it's a very, very rewarding experience, but it's also a very difficult challenge. So I also want to emphasize to you, do not think, and you will tell your friends, oh, I'm doing a walk. Oh yeah, I'm gonna walk 50 Ks or 100 Ks. And they'll say, oh yeah, walking, <laughs> easy, no problem. When I first asked my friends, and I've done things like Kilimanjaro, I've done the Kokoda Track, I've um, done a half Ironman, was my last challenge uh, last year. And you know, this is right up there with all of those kinds of events for different reasons. They're all different, challenging in different ways. So when I said to my friends, I'm sorry, I'm coming after you again, you know, I need sponsorship for yet another event. And they said, 100K walk, Joe, you'll just, you'll stroll that, won't you? And, and I had to re-emphasize them, you try doing it. 
and then you tell me whether I'll be strolling it. So I guarantee we were we went out fast. We we were trying to get a really good time. We our team came in second behind those girls who were a good half hour ahead of us. And it was a real challenge, I can tell you. So please take your training seriously. The harder that you train and the more ready that you are and the more tips that you can take from everyone here tonight to really get all aspects of, of this right, including nutrition, the better experience you'll have and the better you're going to be able to enjoy the event and recover afterwards. So let me, I'm only supposed to have 10 minutes, so I better get on to actually giving you my nutrition tips. So I've got 10 tips for you here, um, and let me just fly through them, and then any specific questions we'll, we'll handle at the end. So the first thing is practice. So we all think about training our body, and it's not hard to understand that you need to get your muscles ready, you need to be fit and able enough to do this, but you actually also have to train your body to handle the nutrition, okay? Which might sound like a funny thing, but the, t the types of foods and the, the impact and the frequency of the way that you're going to eat during the event, particularly if you're doing the 100Ks, is very, very different to normal, and you have to get your gut used to it. You might find initially that certain products, taking a, a glucose gel for example, they're absolutely fantastic for these kinds of endurance sporting events, but if your gut's unused to it, and particularly if you've been trying to follow a low carb diet, you're gonna find that you're, you're running off to the loo, you're going behind bushes every five minutes and it's not going to be pleasant, or you're gonna have a very sore stomach, or you might even be vomiting. Okay, so I can't emphasize enough to you that you must trial all the products that you're going to use. And I brought a few of the products I've got left over from, from what we used, and I can show more of these to you. But there's a number of different things, and we all had our different kinds of favorites. So, for example, things like these gels, you want to practice using them while training because some of them we found were incredibly difficult to open because we were going for a good time. We had, as Lisa suggested, we had the food Nazi in my team, and what she would do is tell us all when we had to have something to eat. We'd worked out very carefully what we had to eat when. We had everything in careful carbohydrate loads of when we had to have, and we weren't allowed to stop to eat. We were only allowed two key stops. We stopped at 60 Ks for, for a break, and, and that was our own main stop. We had a small stop at 30 Ks. The rest of the time you had to eat while walking. That was the rule. So something that was very important was being able to rip up, get your gel out of your, of your waist. We had waist packs as, as like a, a bum bag as well as our packs. So we practiced being able to get food out of the person in front of you to help them if they couldn't reach it, ripping the top off the pack, taking your gel while walking. Um, and those sorts of things are just practical things that you need to practice. Otherwise, you're going to be going, oh, what's this one again? How many grams of carbon in this? What am I supposed to take? So have all that really well planned out in front of you before. Don't bring anything new on the day. You know, one of the things that we got um, were these uh, cliff bars were one of our favorites. We all had different favorites. And because we practice them in training, the other thing that eating your favorite ones en route are that they give you a real uplift. You feel great when you eat foods you like. It's just like normal everyday life. When you eat foods that you really enjoy, you feel good, and that's why you want to eat them again. So it gives you a real lift. You know, when you're in well underway, everybody's happy as Larry to start with, but you will have dips along the way where you think, what am I doing? So when, when we were doing that really long beach walk, and it was pouring rain, it was, the rain and wind was sideways into our faces, and we looked at each other and thought, are we crazy? What are we doing? Being able to have a really tasty snack was such a, a mental boost along the way. Um, so absolutely don't get it wrong or you'll find that you really struggle on the day. Next slide, thanks. So tip two, you can come and have a look at any of these um, and talk to me more about those on the end. The, front, the second thing that I really want to stress to you is that your usual healthy eating that I would normally be promoting to you, and if anyone follows um, some of my advice along the way, it all goes out the window on a bad day, okay? <laughs> this is not a normal situation. The night before Coast Track this year, I Facebooked a picture of my team, we were all up at Lisa Champion's house, um, up on Scotland Island, and I, and I Facebooked a picture of the four of us with all that, getting all our food ready. And someone tweeted back, Dr. Joanna, that's terrible, all that sugar and processed food. Nothing's in, everything's in a packet. And I had to explain back, we are doing a 100K endurance event and we're trying to do it in under 20 hours. This is exactly what we need. So your usual healthy eating rules do not apply. 
You're in a very different situation and your target goal is to provide the fuel that your body needs, not to upset your gut. Your goal is not to feed good gut bacteria. It's not to make you regular on the loo. It's not to slow down absorption so that you can control your weight and burn fat. Your goal is, I need to supply the petrol in the car to make the journey. And that's the way that you need to think of it, okay? So I'll come back to some of these points, but high fiber, low GI, high protein, all these things that you might normally be doing are out of the window. This year, thank you, that's okay. This year, one of my girlfriends happened to, I hadn't realized that she was doing a 50K event. And fortunately, two weeks before the event, she said to me, oh, I didn't realize you were doing cross strike, so am I. She said, oh, have you got any tips as to what to eat? My trainers told me to carry hard boiled eggs and nuts. A typical carb, you know, low carb, paleo diet style trainer who clearly had absolutely no understanding of sports nutrition. So please, if you've got a personal trainer and they give you that kind of advice, Send them to talk to me. Okay. <laughs> Tip three is focus on any weight changes now. If you've signed up thinking this is a fabulous motivation to get fit, lose a couple of kilos, great, you're doing absolutely the right thing. But a few tips for you is don't try and reduce your food intake during long training sessions. Okay? Nutrition is going to be far less important in a short one hour interval training session that you're doing. Um, but if you're doing long events, you need to practice your nutrition during that walk. Don't think I'll try and do a three hour walk and not eat anything. I'll burn loads of fat. All you'll do is hit the wall after an hour and a half and not be able to complete. Or you'll be on your hands and knees. Okay? So, but what you can certainly do is now, on the lead up to Christmas, be thinking about cutting back on, your, on, on some extras, cutting back on the wine at night, making some changes to your nutrition to help you lose those kilos on the run up to Christmas, okay? So that then you will find that with the extra training and really sensible, healthy eating, you're gonna find those kilos come off, okay? My tip there is to concentrate your carbs around your training sessions so that you've got the carbs you need for the training and for replenishing glycogen stores afterwards. Glycogen's your body's carb stores. And then you can drop your carbs by all means if that's the approach you wanna follow at other times, okay? But I do, um, I, you don't need to go low carb, guys. You can go moderate carbohydrate, focus on low GI, and put a few extra carbs in around your training session. You'll get great results. Tip four is provide the correct fuel, okay? Um, very quick overview of what happens. Your body is burning always two fuel sources primarily, fat and carbohydrate, okay? So when we start sitting here, you're actually burning mostly fat, but we're not burning all that much energy, okay? Of course, as soon as we start walking, we start to burn a bit more energy. You're always burning a bit of both, okay? When we start to walk, of course, we're burning more energy in total. You start to burn a bit more carbohydrate, lots more fat. As I raise the intensity of the exercise, either by going faster, walking up a hill, climbing all those stairs, and there are lots, or if you're doing the 50K and you're, you've decided you want to run sections of it, or you're totally mad and you want to run it all, then the more intense that you're doing, the higher that ratio of carbohydrate. You're also still burning loads of fat, so don't panic about that because you're burning more energy overall, but your carbohydrate need gets more. So if you're planning on strolling coast trek and you want to stop for a swim and have cappuccino and you're going to have lunch in Balmoral and you're going to take you know, two days to get there, then it's probably less important. Don't worry too much. You can draw on primarily fat stores, but you know what? And you're not going to burn as much energy, but if you're going to go hard at this, believe me, carbohydrate is your best friend for this event, okay? So I'm going to quote here, Professor Louise Burke is one of the top international sports uh, dietitians. And she's really kind of thought of as the grandmother of sports nutrition, and I was fortunate enough to learn from her at the AIS. And Louise says, when the going gets tough, the tough eat carbs. Okay, so you need to think of yourselves as athletes on the day. You will be a trained athlete, and that's exactly what you need, okay? Thank you. Tip five. Tip five is trickle the carbs, okay? My, my best tip to you is that don't think, oh, damn it, I haven't eaten for an hour and a half. I must have something, and then take on board 10 bananas. That's your fast route to feeling really, really unwell, okay? It's just like any other exercise. You will not feel good if you've got too much food in your stomach or too much liquid for that matter. Really what we're trying to do is can we keep food and liquid moving relatively quickly through the stomach into the small intestine where it gets absorbed? And what we want to be doing is your body's using that carbohydrate at a fairly regular rate, a bit quicker on those uphill sections or when you run, and we need to keep carbohydrate coming into the body. The amount that you have stored will only last you for about an hour and a half, two hours, even shorter if you're going really hard. So unless you keep carbohydrate coming in from externally, you're going to hit the wall. Okay? You can be the tortoise and, and, or the slug and get there really, really slowly, 
But if you want to have any sort of briskness and feel really good and be quite energetic, you need to be trickling those carbs in. So we actually, Lisa was saying every 45 minutes she had her alarm going. By the second 50Ks, we actually were going every 15 minutes you had to eat something. Okay, whether it's just, and it could be just something very small, but we were trickling the carbs in and it really helped get through that second 50Ks. Start the event with full glycogen stores. You need to make sure you've got as much carbohydrate on board. Now you'll do that, you don't have to do any dramatic carb loading by tailoring your training and making sure you're following a high carb diet for the two or three days beforehand, you'll do it. Have a big carb meal the night before, pasta is perfect, we had a risotto the night before, eat some carbs in the morning, we've made a great virtual muesli, but you know, whatever you want to get on board, and then you'll be starting with full glycogen stores. So as a general guide, what my advice is, whatever your body weight is, you need that in grams of carbohydrate in the first 50, somewhere around every 90 minutes to an hour, to two hours. In the second 50, we were aiming to get our grams of carbohydrate every hour, okay? So for me, that meant that I had to eat about, I'm about 65 kilos, I had to get about 65 grams of carbohydrate in me. I didn't actually get close to that because it was so hard to eat. You won't feel like eating, but you have to try and force yourself, and that was, that was what we were aiming for. Next slide, thanks. Tip six is fast stomach emptying foods, and this is where I mean the whole high protein and high fiber and so on has to go out the window. Fat, fiber, and protein, <laughs> all slow down food leaving your stomach, okay? So if you tuck into a very fatty meal, if you had a croissant or a, or a, a meat pie along the way, it's gonna sit in your stomach and you're gonna be feeling rotten climbing those stairs, okay? You need to have food that will go relatively quickly through you. So this is the only time that you will hear me say, have white bread, not whole grain bread, okay? You need white bread, things that will go through your stomach very quickly and you will absorb and then it's out of your gut and you're going to feel a whole lot better, okay? So white bread is really the same as, as sugar. You're going to break it down to glucose very, very quickly, okay? And interestingly, a lot of people will tolerate that a lot better than a whole bunch of jelly beans, okay? The only issue I'll warn you about bread is it can be quite hard to swallow when you're exercising. So the, the, the tip Lisa had about walking up, you know, eat the flats to walk uphill, I learned that the hard way. As I tucked into my Vegemite sandwich, we started climbing a hill and I thought I was going to die. I couldn't swallow. I was trying to suck in air and I couldn't get it past the Vegemite sandwich. Uh, I was in all sorts of trouble until eventually I had to chuck the thing and think, oh, I can't do this. It's going to have to, you know, get, uh, swallowed a lot of water, got my mouth full, and tucked the rest away to eat when we got to the top. So it's the only thing about bread. Make sure that you soften it up somehow. We ended up with sort of like Philadelphia and Vegemite is a great way to get some sodium in there at the same time. So test that. That's another reason to go back to tip one about testing. Thank you. N next slide. Tip seven is get your hydration right. Now, overhydrating is just as bad, just as dangerous as underhydrating or getting dehydrated, okay? On the Kokoda track, the deaths that you've heard about in the Kokoda track are primarily from overhydrating. So it's really important if you don't get a day like we got where, you know, water was, hydration wasn't such an issue because it was kind of falling from the skies at a rapid rate. Um, if you get a really hot day next year, then hydration becomes even more. It's really your top priority if it's a really hot day. Some of us are bigger sweaters than others, and I don't mean to pick on the men, but men tend to be bigger sweaters than girls, yes, gentlemen. Um, but even amongst the, you girls, you'll find some of you will sweat more than others. So if you're a big sweater, and if you have very salty sweat, I mean, sports dietitians can test that to see how salty a sweater you are. But if you know that about yourself, then you really need to think even more about hydration and about electrolyte replacement if you're a big sweater. Overhydrating, if you find that you're going to the loo every 15 minutes, your urine is very watery looking, it looks almost clear like water, and if you're, you're feeling a bit like you've got a urinary tract infection, because it feels like you have to go all the time, that's a sign of either overhydrating and or your electrolytes being low, okay? So your body's trying to get a balance and trying to get the sodium levels in your blood right. So that's why it's especially important that you look at the color of your urine, you register how often you're going to the loo, you should be going to the loo every couple of hours and your urine should be pale, straw colored or less. What I suggest doing is have your bladder in your bag full of water and then carry a bottle that you can make up electrolytes in. So Hydrolyte Sport are one of our sponsors for the event. We used Hydrolyte Sport independently of, of this um, last year. I used them also for my half Ironman. It's a great product and, and they come in sachets that make up very easily to 600 mils. So I just had a 600 ml bottle that I carried in my side pack 
and then I had electrolyte in that, and I alternated between drinking water, and I, we worked out how many hydrolyte, so they come in little sachets, you just throw another one into the bottle when you're finished, fill it up with your water, and we worked out how many sachets we had to have gotten through by certain points in the race. So there's a bit of pre-race planning there, and working out what you need to do. And your plan, of course, has to be adjustable based on the conditions for the day, okay? Thank you. Tip eight is use caffeine judiciously, okay? Caffeine can be absolutely fantastic. It saved me on many an occasion. Um, one of those, and one of the best things is a caffeine gel, okay? So when you're really struggling and you think, I really need an energy lift here, the combination of a hit of glucose with a shot of caffeine can just be the, just be the, uh, the tool that you need to get you through. But don't overuse it, okay? If you start smashing caffeine in the first 10 Ks, you're gonna have to keep it up the whole way. <laughs> Okay, and you're going to find that your gut is affected. So particularly if you're sensitive to caffeine, I actually do a gene test on people to see if you're a caffeine metabolizer or not. But failing knowing, knowing whether you are or not, you probably know how you feel when you have caffeine. If you're a regular coffee drinker and you don't find caffeine upsets you, you're probably going to be happier with it. If you hardly ever have caffeine, test this and make sure and don't overuse it. If you abuse it early, I suggest hanging out until you really need it closer to the end and then that caffeine's going to give you a real lift. <coughs> So tip nine is recovery. Um, you need to recover both from training sessions and then there's obviously a big recovery after the event itself. During recovery, your nutrition needs are different. So here you need to rest, you need to rehydrate, you need to replenish your gly glycogen stores that you've used up, and you need to provide protein. So this is where protein's real role is. Protein's role is in your general weight management and appetite management along the way and in body composition management so that we help you preserve muscle mass. So after long training sessions, you want, or during this training process, I would just be making sure you've got a good protein-rich food in every single meal. Um, you can certainly have, do promote having a high-protein, moderate carb low GI diet for weight control and fat loss. But during after the event itself, that's where you can really use a nice combination of good quality carbs and good por portions of protein distributed evenly through meals. So it's not about having a massive protein load, it's about spreading it out over the day, in the days following recovery, so that you maximize your muscle recovery. So this is the time, post-event, to go back to your low GI, high fiber, um, high protein, and so on. Plenty of plant food program. And then you ditch your sugary snacks. If you've still got bags of jelly beans and glucose gels and whatever, and if you, especially if you've got tasty treats, ditch them after the event, or you'll find that you're snacking on them and not walking at all. <laughs> Tip 10 is the final thing is to listen to your body. I could talk all night about nutrition, and I'm sorry that I'm kind of um, rambling through this relatively quickly, but we've got so much information to give you. You need to listen to your body. I can give you tips, but I can't individualize everything, and everybody's different. On the day, during your training, you need to listen to your own body and get to know how it's feeling. It's almost a good thing to get to that point where your glycogen stores are low so that you know what the warning signs are. One of my team members this year, in the previous year, had had a really bad hit the wall experience, but fortunately, the team members recognized it. She was dizzy, slurring her words, stumbling a little in the road, not making coherent conversation. We were all four girls, so we pretty much talked the, the whole 19 and a half hours. And so they recognized that something was wrong, and very quickly got her to sit down, took a glucose gel into her, got some water into her. Within 10 minutes, she was absolutely fine again. So if you recognize the signs early, you can act. So watch out for your teammates, watch out for the symptoms in yourself. Act very quickly, otherwise you'll get to the point where someone can't continue and is really quite unwell. Um, if that does happen to you, make sure that you eat, but then it's not just getting that snack straight into them. Remember, the rate of glucose use is quite high, so you then need to make sure that there's a snack happening every 15 minutes from there on in to make sure that we keep <coughs> symptoms up. And the same deal with hydrate. So remember that hydrate, dehydration symptoms can be very similar to having low glucose. Sometimes it can be slightly difficult to identify which one it is. So, so try to really be aware of those things while you're training, and then you'll be able to handle them well on the day. So just finally, before I step off the stage, thank you, I've got one last slide. Where to go for further help? Well, I have put together, um, with the help of the girls, we did a coast track nutrition guide. So there's lots more information in there. So to, do make sure that, that you read that. Um, and, and there's information there on how much carbohydrates in foods, what constitutes little snacks. And that's really, really helpful to know. I can make, I know I made up little 15, 20 gram carbohydrate snacks. They were all individually packed in Ziploc, so it made it very easy to get the right step. And I also wanted to just introduce you to, it's really my Get Lean program that is the nutrition partner for this year. So if you are looking for help for healthy eating, 
Um, the Get Lean rules will go out the window on event day, but between now and event day, Get Lean is, is my new lifestyle program that's, that's been in a test phase through this year. We have a much bigger and better launch happening in February, but you can get on the website now and join up and be one of my foundation members. I'm looking for that feedback from people along the way so that I can really launch with a bigger and better program come February. There's a very small monthly fee associated, but you get stacks of stuff from me with a weekly email and blogs and recipes and emails and so on. So I hope that that's helpful for you, and you'd do me a favor too if you join up and give me some feedback along the way. That's what I'm going to be doing with my members over the next three months. So thank you very much. Questions we'll handle um, just at the end. Thank you, Dr. Jonah. That was awesome. Really good learning for us. And if you're wondering where you can find that um, chapter on nutrition, it's in Chapter 8 of the Sydney Coast Street Training Manual, and it's the Nourishing Your Body section. Um, next, we're going to hear from a lady who um, is the Managing Director of Square One Physiotherapy Therapy and Sports Injury Management and has two practices in Mossman. Holly actually worked with us on this year's Coast Trek event, and she's going to talk to you a bit about how to look after your feet. I can tell you that one of the main reasons that people withdraw from long distance trekking or running events is because of blisters um, and other issues with their feet. So if you can learn to look after your feet, um, you're going to be way ahead of the game. So I'd like to welcome Holly Brasher to the stage. Um, I've got a very short time to talk to you guys about um, probably the most important asset that you'll have on event day. Um, I've actually got slides that need a lot of clicking. So um, hopefully Alex will be able to keep up with me and uh, work out what I'm talking about. So uh, first thing I'm going to talk about is blister prevention, um, which as we said is the most important thing you need to think about. Um, in terms of shoe choice, we probably recommend that you either get uh, runners or trail runners um, and, and buy them early so you can train them and don't leave it up to the last minute and, and don't get new ones just for the day. Go for comfort, so research tells us that it's not the most expensive shoes um, it's not the brand name shoes that are the best ones for your feet. Uh, it's actually the ones that you try on and you find the most comfortable and the ones that are going to be the best uh, type of shoe for your foot type. Um, the main point probably for the day is don't take your shoes off. Um, you'll all want to take your shoes off and walk in the water and feel that nice soft sand. Uh, but your feet will get wet, they'll get sandy, they'll break down your skin conditions and you'll easily get blisters for the rest of the time. Socks. So I recommend you wear two pairs of socks. Try for a thin liner underneath your main pair of socks. Um, also experiment with using Vaseline or cold boring one. Um, so try and smother your feet in it um, and reduce some of the friction. But once again, try it in training before uh, the actual event day. Um, on the day, make sure you have some clean pairs of socks in your pack uh, that you can change with some of the cheap ones. Um, so if you are prone to blisters, um, taping is the way to go. Um, so we suggest that you use some fixable stretch tape, which you can probably get from your physio. Um, some pharmacies do stock it, but you're probably better off asking someone who has a bit more of an idea of um, what the best type of tape to use is. Um, and some sports tape to go over some more friction prone areas. Um, strapping for blisters is completely different to strapping uh, for sports injuries. So it shouldn't be tight. Um, you probably need to either ask your physio um, to demonstrate on your own foot um, I have produced a YouTube video, which we did put on the website last year. I'm not sure if it's going up this year, uh, but it will be on my website, so you can log on there and have a look. Practice, do it in training. If you don't understand it, or if it's actually hurting your feet, um, seek, seek some advice before the actual day. Um, then on the day, the best thing to do is make sure you do carry some sports tape in your bag. If you have any hot spots, stop. Address them early, they're only going to get worse. Band-aids won't um, cut it, unfortunately. Make sure you clean the area um, and cover it with sports tape. So next thing I want to talk about is just looking after your body and it's mainly in training. So address any niggles early. Um, apart from the odd sprained ankle that you'll get on one of the trails, most injuries with this type of event uh, are overuse injuries. Okay, so using your body uh, more than you normally would um, is going to cause certain overload on structures of your body. Um, sorts of things like having regular massages after long training days will certainly help avoid some sorts of injuries. The most common injuries that you need to look for is Alex. Um, pain at the front of the knee, so it's patellofemoral pain. It's Alex. ITB friction, so it's pain on the lateral side of the knee. Achilles tendinopathy, or pain at the back of the heel. And then also pain under the arch of the foot or the heel. Um, 
problems like plantar fasciitis. So if you're starting to get any niggles in those sort of areas, uh, best get them sorted out. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the other thing that we need to talk about is stretching and recovery. Um, so maintaining good biomechanics is going to prevent injury. Um, and we do this by stretching. Okay, trying to keep the muscles at correct lengths. When you train and exercise, it shortens muscles, so you actually need to um, stretch to try and counteract that. Stretch after you train. Doesn't matter so much about stretching before your training session. Hold stretches for 30 seconds to one minute and um, just repeat twice for each muscle. So the main muscles that you need to look at are your hip flexors, your quads, hamstrings, and calf muscles, so all your lower leg main muscles. You can also get some sort of um, self-help devices like the foam rollers up in the top right-hand corner or the pocket physios, like self-triggering devices, um, which can be key to actually managing your own injuries at home. <laughs> recovery. I mean, the main sorts of recovery you need to think about are nutrition, hydration, um, and getting enough sleep. So seven to eight hours sleep a night is probably the most important tool. Um, for some crazy reason, everyone wants to jump in an ice bath. So I thought I'd mention it this evening. Um, rather than contrast hot and cold, um, going straight for cold water immersion is the sort of um, recovery tool that you want to use for this sort of training. So, that's, um, so especially because you guys have been training over the summer heat, the water ideally needs to be between 12 and 15 degrees, but 20 degrees uh, you can also get some benefits from. And 20 degrees is about the temperature of the water that comes out of your tap. Probably needs to go up to chest level, so you really need to sit in it uh, all the way to the top of the bar and stay in there for 5 to 20 minutes. <laughs> Last thing I want to talk about is strengthening. So walking on flat ground does not strengthen your muscles. Um, so you need to think about what your exercise base is. If you've just run a half marathon, you're probably fine. Um, but if you've just come off the back of having two or three babies and this is your next big challenge or you've got a, had a midlife crisis, um, you're going to need to do some strengthening. Um, so strengthening main muscles in the lower body is doing some squats, some calf raises, so you can do it on a step or just off the floor, some step ups and also some side leg raises is going to help you prevent any of those injuries. So just um, some key points from my talk tonight. Uh, prevention is better than cure. Try and sort out your niggles early before they become a problem. Every year uh, before post-strength and also Oxfam, the night before we get probably two or three people ringing up at 4 p.m. <laughs> wanting treatment for an injury that they've had for a few months. So try and get them sorted out before the night before. Do not try anything new on the day, so that includes Footwear, hydration, as Joanna talked about, any nutrition. I've written it there twice because some of you will do it. Um, <laughs> um, further discussion and specific advice on more injury prevention uh, we'll be talking about on the training day that Lisa mentioned. Um, if you do want to have a look at some of the exercise sheets that I've talked about, um, and also I'll post the video up on um, how to take to prevent blisters, um, have a look at our website, just go to our physio page and I'll put a little section at the bottom for post trackers. Thank you. I just wanted to add something because it appeared in my inbox today about knee pain. I'll be very quick. And the statistic from some recent research said that for every one kilo of body weight you lose, if, you, if that is your need and that is your desire in your training for post track it takes four kilos of pressure off your knees. So anybody who is having sort of niggly, niggly knees, um, if your weight is where you need it to be, that's fabulous. But if you're carrying a few extra kilos over 70,000 steps, <laughs> it's um, not ideal to be having extra kilos on your bottom. So get the kilos off the bottom and it will also help your knees, which is a really good idea. So our next guest um, is an awesome, amazing, incredible uh, young man and he runs Australia's top charity, uh, and he doesn't need a huge introduction, but I'm going to give him one anyway, the fabulous Brian Dolan. Um, so thanks, and congratulations, you're amazing. Um, I'm already exhausted from hearing you guys talk about the preparation. <laughs> um, 
I'm, I'm doing it this year. I've been going to do it for four years. So, fellow walkers. <laughs> um, uh, you talked before, Di talked before about people you know, having big challenges. Well, I think Fred left us an enormous challenge. I mean, Fred's dream was that no one, anywhere, should have to go needlessly blind. And the key words there are needlessly blind avoidably blind. Um, some blindness is not avoidable. I remember starting a speech, however, in 2006, when the first time I met Di, um, the Wild Women on Top had a, a, a function in this very building, a uh, dance, a fundraiser for the Fred Hollows Foundation. It was a terrific night. I remember nervously getting up and I had my speech all prepared. And I started that speech in 2006 by saying, there are 45 million people in the world today who are blind and 80% of them don't have to be. And then a couple of years later, new figures were released and I had to change the start to the speech. And so I was able to say, there are 39 million people in the world today who are blind and 80% of them don't have to be. And as of January this year, I had to change the speech again. And so now I start to just by saying, there are 32.4 million people in the world who are blind and 80% of them don't have to be. And so the dream that Fred had, that he shared with a whole bunch of other people around the world, is that avoidable blindness can be ended. Now, you won't be surprised, or perhaps you probably won't be surprised when I tell you that 90% of people who are blind live in the developing world. Now that tells you straight away, it's not about medicine. We know what to do medically, right, in those 80% of cases. Um, it's a matter of poverty, it's a matter of access, and guess what? It's also a matter of gender. Over 60% of people who are blind are women. Now, now, why is that? Well, women don't control the household access, they don't control the household resources. Women find it harder to get access to the medical services. In relation to, to, to trachoma, the, 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 the infection for trachoma is actually passed through kids. Who's picking up the kids? <laughs> uh, who's holding the kids? Um, now, so women suffer disproportionately from blindness in the developing world. Um, and it's part of the beautiful synergy, I think, of the spirit of Coast Trek, that it is principally a women's event. Um, some of us are lucky enough to also be, some of us men are lucky enough to also get a Guernsey. But it's principally a women's event. So when you're walking and you're at, you know, a kilometre 45, or for some of you, kilometre 95, and it's hurting, and you're wondering, well, is it all worth it? Well, think about kids like Van, Think about all the women in the developing world who are blind and who, because of you and because of your fundraising efforts, are not going to be blind. Um, I just got back from Myanmar. I arrived in on, some, uh, on Sunday at lunchtime. Over four days last week in Yangon, the team of surgeons that I was with from Nepal principally, and they were training surgeons in Myanmar, in Yangon, that team over four days restored the site to 604 people over four days. Um, I left, they then went north um, to Bago in Myanmar, and over the past couple of days they've restored site to over 600 more people. This is really going on. Right? We really are taking on this, this issue of needless blindness. Fred laid down the challenge. It's a big challenge. It scares me. Uh, it scares me because I stand up all the time and say, we're doing this, we're going to do this. And it scares me because you know, it is a big challenge. But there are people all around the world right, who are dedicated to ending avoidable blindness. People shouldn't go blind because of cataract. Most of us will get a cataract. Right? In Australia, you deal with it. I mean, we heard that the, the report um, a couple of weeks ago where in terms of elective surgery, it's cataracts and knee operations. Probably all going to need one of those. <laughs> <laughs> it's cataract and knee operations that are the, the most common elective surgeries in Australia. We deal with it. We don't go blind. In countries like Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, in Kenya, Eritrea, Ethiopia, people are going blind. It's needless blindness. What you're doing and the funds you're going to raise are going to help us get to those people and stop them being blind. Remind yourself of that at kilometre 45, kilometre 95, and in
advance. Thank you. Uh, I had a look today at the leaderboard of the Coast Track website, and it was a great pleasure to see that already a lot of you have started fundraising. So, well done. It's incredible to see some teams already have reached more than their target, over $4,000. The total today allows us already to help over 3,000 girls or women, people like Van. So thank you very much and I hope you keep it up. I will now give you a few little tips how you can fundraise easily and where to start. I have done Coast Track three times now and have fundraised Coast for Coast Track as well and I can tell you that the fundraising part will be the easiest and less <laughs> painful part of the whole exercise. I have to say though, Marcus did win the 100 kilometers in 14 hours and... Something like that. Ford Lightning. He's a machine. He's a machine. So have you heard from I? And have to try hard for it. So, one of the first steps, which most of you probably have already done, and a lot of you have received an email to remind you today, is you need to activate your personal fundraising account or page. Once you have access to your personal page, you will be able to upload your own pictures, to upload your own story, and go to your friends and tell them about Coastred and tell them about why you're doing this for free. Another important part this year is we have a brand new mobile app, CD Coast Track app. All of us have a little iPhone or smartphone in the pocket. This is one of the easiest way to fundraise this year. You're in a coffee or in a pub and talk to your mates and friends and they're all really impressed about your Coast Track adventure and offer you to help and offer you to sponsor you. In the past you had to go home, remember the email address, send them an email. <laughs> Now you can catch them when you talk <laughs> A few little tips with your finger, you know, get their email address, ask them for their credit card details. <laughs> Immediately you have your fundraising increase and your friend gets a tax receipt sent to his email. Easy way, download, it's free on iTunes or on Google uh, app shops. Now, obviously you have to go and ask your friends. One way, as I mentioned, you can use your app, send out emails to your friend, link it to your Facebook. You might hear back from your friends, you might raise some money, but probably have to ask again. Right? Use Twitter, use Facebook, and most of you are probably parents, you know, if you persistence enough, you ask again, and eventually you will get your $25, which will help Ben and other people like Ben. Personally, myself, I prefer to engage my friends with the fundraising and so there's different ways you can do that. We, my team, normally organize an annual trivia night. Okay? It's a little bit more work because you've got to find a venue. Any RSL or pub probably will offer you for free the venue. On our website you will find a whole list of trivia masters. They are happy to come and help you to organize the event. They charge you maybe a dollar a person or something like that. But in a night like that, we raise normally five to ten thousand dollars for free. So a bit more work, easy to do. Another way would be organizing a movie night. <laughs> it's not a scary thing. Again, you can go to your local cinema, ask them for a fundraising opportunity. They will sell you the movie tickets for eight, ten dollars. You go out there and ask your friends for twenty-five dollars, saves one person's eyesight, and again, you very quickly have reached your fundraising target. Workplace, ask your boss, ask your HR department. A lot of the workplace people will, the workplaces, they will happily support their staff in fundraising and by matching the donations you have already raised. So again, you can double your fundraising very quickly. Some of you might be hidden master chefs. We have a colleague at work, Fred Hollows, who is partic participating uh, in this year's Coast Track. She cooks a delicious with it curry, Indian curry. And what she did, she cooked a pot of curry on a Sunday night, bought, brought the lunch packets of curry to work and sold them off for $10. We have a curry Monday every month now. I'm sure she will reach her fundraising target very easily. So don't be afraid to ask your friends. You need 20 friends 
asking for $25, and you have reached your target. Post the little evening fundraising trivia night, movie night, and again, you easily reach your target, so it's not a scary thing. And remember, if somebody says no and doesn't want to support you, they're not saying no to you. They're probably just saying no to help a girl like Anne. So don't take it personal. Thank you very much. <laughs> if you need any help, all right, we are here. Uh, Alex, my, Alex, myself, we are sitting at the Fred office and we are only a phone call or an email away to assist you if you need any help with your fundraising. Thank you very much and good luck. So the question is, how do you train your body to do the night walking from having to walk through the night? Go night walking. <laughs> <laughs> I know it seems really obvious, but you just put your head torch on, you grab a couple of friends, and you actually go for a walk. Do you sleep during the day to try? And no. No, you'll be amazed because it's so exciting walking in the bush at night time. You actually stay awake. It's much easier than you would think. In the actual event when you've got to walk all night, for me, that's when at about 2 or 3 a.m. I want my triple coffee. So a strong coffee or, or something I never ever, ever have, which is a mother or a red bull. One of those terrible things. Never drink it any other time, never fancy it. But at 3 a.m. it does give you that don't have five of them because that killed a guy in, a run, in an event recently. Don't have five. Just one. <laughs> and do practice it in one of your long walks. But yeah, you will be amazed. If your body just does it because it's exciting for a one-off, not every night. The question is, if someone in your team is injured and drops out, can you carry on? Yes, certainly you can. You've got to have a minimum of two people um, during the day and three at night. And if there's less of you, you can join up with another team. So you just need to let the, um, us know that that person's actually withdrawn. And you'll find out more about how to do that closer to event day. Uh, there's a question about swelling in the hands um, and in the body. Uh, I'll get Jonah to, to answer that one for you over, over endurance events. Swelling in the hands. Um, the, the thing that's happening there is that if you imagine blood pressure, the way that you get blood back from your extremities back to your heart is by the muscles contracting. So when you're doing an endurance event that's involving mostly your lower leg muscles, your body is working hard there to get the blood and the nutrients and oxygen to your lower leg muscles. So what's happening is that you're getting pulling of fluid in your hands. The best tip that I've got for you is actually use walking poles. Walking poles will make an enormous difference. And, and I just wanted to say to all of you, if you're thinking walking poles are just for people with dodgy knees, seriously they're not. Every single four of us used poles. I was completely converted. Your hands will not swell the same way. It makes you use your upper body. It means that you're contracting those muscles in your upper body and that gets the fluids back from the extremities from your hands back to your heart. You'll be so much more comfortable and it really does take some of the pressure um, off the lower body. And when you're in those final, um, 10, 20 Ks, you will be so thankful that you've been using your poles. From a nutritional perspective, just make sure that you've got your electrolytes right. If your electrolytes are going all over the place, that's when you're going to start getting fluid shifts from the blood into tissues, and you're going to start having problems with, with more of that kind of swelling issues. So the question is, as a first timer, is it better to do the day 50 or the night 50? <laughs> Um, I would harder. say the day is harder because of the soft sand and the headlands that you're climbing over. The night's easier terrain, but you have to be you have to practice walking in the dark, for instance, and you also have to practice walking through the night. So um, think about how you might feel in the dark, um, and also the heat because the day is generally warmer. And if you prefer a cooler um, event, you're going to go for the night event, um, more cityscapes and. Um, a bit more urban than the first section. In terms of the results from this year's event, more people finish the night than finish the day, and obviously more finish the day than the 100. So the night, we think that's a good indication that the night is the easiest, even though the weather wasn't quite as difficult in the night. But if you do choose to walk the night, your footwear is really important because of those hard surfaces. So, um, yeah, we recommend for a beginner the night is an easier event. A question about how not to lose toenails. <laughs> <laughs> you, you probably will lose them. Um, so probably correct fitting footwear. 
and cut your nails really short. Can I just say on that, the record is 10 toenails. <laughs> Not as many. But, but what we have learned is even if your shoe is half a size, your normal shoe size in coast trek over that distance may not be right. We find sometimes you have to go up another half size because only the teeniest, teeniest, teeniest infinitesimal bit of pressure on your toenail for 70,000 steps is enough to dislodge it. So you might not even feel sore toes, they might just feel fine and then suddenly you kind of, the next day you go, oh, and then they go black and fall off. But that takes a long time. So avoid that. That is, I believe, I, I actually think, Holly, like, I believe that's, they will grow back. Sometimes they're not as pretty as they were before though, when they grow back. I actually think, I think they're preventable, but you do have to make it a little project. If you want to keep your toenails, really, really think about what you would need to do. Cutting them, you can't make them, you can't have them pretty and long anymore. You have to shorten them. Ah, and don't have a pedicure a day before or the week before because as much as it's lovely to get those, you know, all that dead skin taken off, um, a little bit of dead skin is good. <laughs> but big chunks of dead skin is not good. So get rid of the big chunky callousy bits, but don't get rid of everything. Um, so foot, there is a great detail in the training manual about feet and everyone's feet are different, but do read it because there's a real, there's lots to be learned about your feet in that manual. We'll take two more questions. The question is if you're doing the day walk, do you need the fluoro safety vest? And the answer is yes. And we have a special deal for Coast Trekkers. You can get four of them for $49 delivered to one address. And you'll find those details on the website. They are a council requirement. And in the day 50, you do walk on some road, near some road areas. And you may also be finishing in the dark. So you are required to wear those fluoro vests. You don't have to wear them the whole way on road crossings and in the dark. Last question. So a question about the support crew. I'd say they, they're extremely important. And in actual fact, most support crew end up coming and doing the event the following year because they think it's easier than being support crew. <laughs> um, so choose your support crew wisely. Ask family and friends and divide it up into shifts, especially if you're doing the 100K. Ask them to meet you at certain points along the way, somewhere that's away from traffic where you can get some access to a vehicle safely and get them to bring boxes of your favorite treats. Um, I usually take one of these plastic um, boxes. If each person in the team has their name on a plastic box with all your goodies in it, it's easy for your support crew to drag it out at um, the spots where you're going to meet them and give access to all your gear and all the extra bits you might need. Um, you need to line your support crew up now and get the dates in the diary and have some backups in place uh, too. And just tell them that anything you say or do during the event they shouldn't take personally because um, <laughs> you don't want to lose any friends. Alright ladies and gentlemen, lastly before we draw the lucky door prizes, I'd like to say thank you very much to our um, panel of experts here tonight. Also to our VIPs, to Ruth Hollows um, and, and to her sister, the daughters of Fred, um, Ben Phillips for coming back to do his third coast trip, Alex Wildman, Brian Doolin, David Carroll, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you ladies and gentlemen. On your way out there's some free hydrolyte samples, there's also a handout with all our top tips from tonight. And tonight's presentation will be available online for any of your team members in this room.